I'll start by just introducing myself. Yeah. I was born in a very small, tiny village, not very far from here. When I was born, that village did not have running water or electricity. Electricity came to that village when I was 12 years old. So I grew up in this beautiful, small village by the mountain called Mandar Hill. Mandar Hill's claim to fame is it's supposed to be the mountain that was used for churning the ocean in the Indian mythology. So my journey actually starts from that tiny village in Mandar Hill to Microsoft and back to India. In this journey, I've had the fortune to meet many, many different people from different walks of life. I met people who were poorest of the poor in these villages. I met richest of the rich, billionaires, multi-billionaires, even hundred billions of dollars. I met and learned from village elders who, not, who did not have formal education, but had wisdom. I learned from world-class leaders like Bill Gates, Satya, even spiritual leaders like His Holiness, Dalai Lama. But I also had the experience of failures and success. And I learned from them. I'll tell you, people love to talk about ups and downs, success and failures, but nobody talks about the third side of success and failure, and that is learning, because both can give you the learning, actually. Learning comes, big learning comes from failures, actually. Success, as Bill Gates said, success is a lousy teacher because it seduces you to believe you'll never fail and you know it all. On the other hand, failure is the greatest teacher of life from the school of life. So what I'm going to do today is talk about five such stories of learning for myself. And then I'm going to close my talk with the key that I believe can power your success accelerate your success to the highest potential. So my first story starts, is called Ideas of Possibilities. I was 11 year old. One more fine morning, I found myself getting up in the middle of the field, green, green field of paddy, a river flowing by, and I was hungry. The previous evening, I had gone with Chukri Mama taking the paddy to the market, to the farmer's market to sell the paddy. We sold it all, got good price. On the way back, it got dark and we decided to stay back because there was no electricity there. And then in the morning when I got up, he asked me, do you want egg, boiled egg? And I said, yes, but I also, I also resisted saying this, yeah, I know that we have egg. He smoked, so I knew we had, we had lighter or matchbox, but there was no utensil to, to boil the water. But he said, okay, come along, and I, I follow him. He goes to the river, he gets in the river. He doesn't even have any, any utensil. And 20 minutes after that, I had the world's best boiled egg. Can you imagine how he did that? What he did was he dipped in the water and did not take out water, but he took out mud, small amount of mud, wrapped up the eggs in the mud, put it in the fire, and that was the most tasting egg, best tasting egg I have ever had in my life. I learned a couple of things that day. First, there's always a solution. Of course, you can learn from anybody is the other thing that comes out, but there's always a solution. That's why I tell my daughters, never give up. Just Stay calm, think about it, think out of the box, life will be great. My next story is really about joining Microsoft. The years between me growing up in the village, getting to St. Zevers, Calcutta, getting into Roorkee, doing computer science, getting into PhD in Austin, Texas, and then finding myself in front of Microsoft was just short six to seven years. I got to Microsoft. I was doing PhD in data science and machine learning, and my, my advisors quit and joined the industry, so I thought I was going to join the industry. So I get to Microsoft, and the first person I meet is the HR person, and she says, 
okay, you're going to work in Visual Basic because Microsoft was founded in this basic tool to write code. And I said, look, I've never done compilers. I don't know tools. I know data. I know machine learning. I think you have made a mistake. Either you have hired the wrong person or you're sending me to the, right, to the wrong team. And she said something very profound. She said, we don't hire people for what they know. We hire people what they can know, what they can learn. And that, I said, OK, fine. If you're telling me to learn, I'll, I'll take the bet. So I go back to Building 18. I met my manager. He walked me around and met me uh, met, uh, to meet all the 15 people in the team. And that was the culture that time. I meet all these amazing people because that was the team that was first founded Microsoft. People had worked there for 15 years. They were compiler people who had done PhDs. And then I meet Tim Patterson, the person who sold the DOS operating system to Bill Gates in $50,000. That changed the history of this planet because that gave birth to personal computer. And I'm saying, how will I succeed here? These people know so much. I don't know anything. So I come back to my room, and my manager read that fear and anxiety in my face. And he said, look, we know you are smart, but you know everybody's smart. And I said, tell me about that. And then he said something amazing. Then he said, but I'll tell you how to succeed in spite of that. And I, I was like, in awe, oh, please tell me, because I'm dying here. I'm not telling him, just feeling like that. And then he said, Rajiv, the way to differentiate yourself and get ahead is hard work. That got imprinted in my, in my heart. And I worked crazy hours, 14 hours, 15 hours, 16 hours. I just loved it, by the way, because you're learning. You're producing stuff. Never complained. Just worked hard. And those are the two learnings on the first day of Microsoft. Years go by, six, seven years. It doesn't help that me and my wife both are working in Microsoft, both are crazy hours. Then one day we realized that she said, maybe we should do something different. Why don't you try being a manager? Because you feel like you have some more traits to become a manager. I said, OK, fine, I'll go talk to them. So I went to my management team and said, look, maybe I can try being a lead. And lo and behold, they made me a manager. So I become a manager. Life was great. For a few months later, I just realized I don't know how to make decisions. What happened? So the situation was, I hired a very senior person, Jonathan, from, from, a comp like from a company that was doing the best work at that time in the tools. And then I have a very young, talented engineer, Suzanne, and she's doing some piece of work. And she comes to me on Wednesday. She says, I'm going to go on vacation next two weeks, but when I come back, I'll finish this work. She, I said, fine, great. This is great. On when Thursday, I meet. John, I told him that she's going, and we're just discussing. He said, oh, you know, that is an area I'm very good at. I'm going to go finish it, no problem. So on Friday, I said, OK, fine. On Friday, I meet her again. I told Sue that just have fun, have good vacation. John will going to finish this work. And she said, no, 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 I know how to do it. I'll come back and finish it, no issues. And we just had a conversation. I did not pay attention. She went away. Two Fridays later, we celebrated. That piece of work was done. Uh, life was great. On Monday, everybody was happy. We, were going to, we had finished that project. She comes to my room at lunchtime and very upset, saying, Rajiv, you let me down. How can John finish this when I want you to do this? I'm going to undo everything he's done. I'm going to redo because I know better. I did the initial work. That's my project. And I said, Sue, she's already, he's already done it. Please don't do that. He will feel bad. She said, nothing doing. I really feel very bad that somebody else had to do my work. I, that's pride of ownership, you know? I should respect that. So I went back to John and said, John, she's really feeling bad. She's going to back out your work and redo everything because she thinks she can do better. And John said, I'm the best engineer on this planet, and you don't trust me to do the job. Why do you even hire me? I'm telling you, I do not know what to say to whom, when. I just went back and forth. And then within a few days, I saw a mail from Bill Gates that said how to make good decisions. I read the mail multiple times. He says all the right things. Get the right, all the data. Don't get into analysis palaces. Talk to people who's done this work. All the right things. But the fifth thing that really, really touched me, and he said, you'll make the best decision if by knowing your goal, what is the vision, what is your ultimate purpose. That will help you decide the right uh, choice or the right decision. If you look back, go back to the situation, if my goal was to keep everybody happy, 
then I should tell John, look, I can't afford Sue to be unhappy. Morale will go down, so I'm going to just let her do that. But if my goal was to ship the product on time or before time and give it to customer, then I could tell Sue that, look, we need to finish because we don't have time to back up and then get a delay of two weeks. I just did not know that. So that was a learning moment for me. Many years later, just a few years back, Satya became the CEO, and I was talking to him after six months, and he was telling me how he's met all the CEOs in the Bay Area and all the learnings. And I asked him, so what did you learn from these CEOs? What did they tell you? He said a few things, but in the top three, he said, almost everybody said, make lots of decisions as a CEO and get most of them right. That is the importance of life, of decision making in life, and that has really helped me all along my career. I have spent a lot of time because this is such a deep thing. I have really thought about why did not I know how to make a decision. You know, I don't know about today, but when I was growing up, if there was Diwali, my parents would tell me, okay, wear this, Dashera, eat this. When you grow up in twenties, in twenties, marry this person, wife, husband, whoever. So between what you eat, what you wear, and whom you marry for the rest of your life, when do we get to make decisions? So anyway, you should evaluate for yourself how good you are and, 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 and then learn from there, okay? So that's my, when I became the manager, that was my first hard learning, actually. My next one is being a leader. See, being a leader then is different than becoming a manager. Because manager, you can become by getting a title. Leader, people will make you leaders. If they follow you, you are a leader, no matter what title you have. Gandhi did not have any title, but still people, the whole country followed him. That is leader as an IC, individual contributor, you know? So anyway, so a few years later, just very quickly actually, became, becoming the first manager, they made me a general manager very quickly. And I was very proud that, hey, I must be doing something good that they decided to make me a general manager. And that pride lasted very little because very quickly I realized people don't listen to me. And I'm saying, did not they made me general manager so that they can listen to, they have to listen to me? But nobody listened to me. So one morning I just broke down. I go to my manager and say, Kavi, tell me what's wrong with this. This morning, 10 o'clock, we met all the senior people. I just said something in the beginning, nobody really paid attention. Towards the end, Andrew said exactly the same thing and everybody loved it. We decided to go forward, we have a plan. And he said, yeah, now that you tell me yes, you did say the same thing. I said, what's wrong then? Why do not people listen to me? He said, you don't have any presence. I said, okay, tell me what is presence? How do I get presence? And he said, yeah, presence means you, you walk into the door, nobody listens, nobody really notices. You sit down, nobody notices. You say something, nobody notices. I said, tell me how to fix it. He said, I don't know. I said, okay, that's very good. You tell me I have a problem. You don't tell me my solution. But he was an awesome manager, awesome leader. He, get me, he got me all kinds of mentors and coaches. There was a time I had like five or six people trying to fix me up. They taught me how to sit. They taught me how to stand. They taught me how to talk to one-on-one, -on -one, one in five, 100 people, 1,000 people in the room. They're all learned traits. Like example, in India, we are, we are told to put the down, look down to talk so that you are paying respect. But in the world, if you look down while talking, they think either you don't have confidence or you're looking down on the other person. So you really have to re, you have to reimagine yourself. You have to reinvent yourself. Nobody is a born leader. It's a learned trait. And you have to invest time and attention to learn those things. So that's my uh, becoming a leader, actually, OK? My next one, life was going great, actually. My next learning came, it was, a lear it was life was doing great. I was doing good in, 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 in job, I had two daughters, but something was bothering me. I was not feeling complete, so I stepped back, and I think everybody reaches that, that phase in life where you have to step back and ask this question, what do you really want in life? It's not just money, it's what is it? And uh, I learned I, that, that Few years of introspection really taught me what I wanted in life, my story of life. So let me tell you a perspective, actually, that will make it very clear. When I go to IIM Rachi or IIT Delhi, it's easy to fly for me, so I go there. What is the first thing you'll ask me to find a job? How much money you'll give me? 
Once you, have, you know that okay, we'll give you well money, then what kind of job you'll give me? Once you have money and job, then you decide, okay, uh, relationship, family, marriage, kids, parents, friends, all the relationships. Fourth is self-actualization, spirituality, self-realization, very bottom of the list. Fast forward from 22 to my dad, my dad is 82 year old. What is the number one thing he cares about? None of them. It's health. It's easy to forget health, but health, once you lose, you'll never get it back, or very hard to get back. So health is very important. Then if you are really actualized, you have done so much good on this planet that you feel a bliss through whatever means, then you don't care about anything else because you are in bliss. Next is relationship. And as relationship is about people like around my dad, for example, we, he says, don't give me money. I don't need money. You tell me, you and Rekha, you love me or not. You know, that's important to him. As Warren Buffett said, the most, the best measure of success in life is do people whom you love, love you back. That is the high bar, not money. Money is in the bottom, as somebody said. Being a billionaire in coffin has no meaning. See, it has flipped completely. It doesn't flip when you are 40 years old or 50 years old. It keeps changing. It's OK to, in the beginning, say, hey, money is important, job is important. But remember, it will change. Money is not the, it is a means, not an end. When I was in the midlife, it was my kids' career, their education. That was high priority. So it just, remember, at least for me, these are the five things that matters. And I also know it changes over time. You should take what you can from mine, but you should spend time thinking what you want out of life, and that will be your story of life. In summary, I'll say the key that will propel your success is to have the ability or continue to learn. Be a lifelong learner. You have to learn to learn, and that is the superpower you need to bring up. Because you have it, but you give up. I'm, I'm kind of intrigued to see so many young professionals. They think they have done it. They have achieved it. They stop learning, and that's the end. As somebody said, either you are growing or you are dying and perishing. And for growing, you have to learn. And that's the ability that you have to bring and big forth, actually. 80%, 90% of what you need to learn, you learn outside of classrooms, actually, to be successful in this, in this career. Then the question is, how do you learn and what do you learn? How do you learn is the important one. I think this is very simple. It starts with curiosity. If you're curious, you listen. Generous listening of things around you. Second is being vulnerable and humble to accept that you don't know everything. The fact is that most people on this planet don't know everything anyway. But still our ego stops us from being humble and being vulnerable. Then you will ask, what do I learn then if I'm humble? What you, do know, what you need to learn, you already, the universe actually already knows what you need to learn. The reason you are in that situation, in a difficult situation, because that learning needs to come from the situation. It's your vulnerability to accept that the universe knows better and learn from that. Because you don't know how to connect the dots looking forward. You can only connect dots looking backwards. If you look at your life and see all learnings you have had in the past, that's helping you today. So today, you have to learn things that will help you in the future. So remember that. Now the question is, how do you learn from the environment, the context? by being present, by being there, by being mindful of the situation you are in. And for being mindful, you have to practice mindfulness. So you have to learn some ways to do mindfulness. And I'll end by saying, look, everybody, I believe, should do at least 20 minutes of mindfulness practice. And if you think you're too busy and you don't have time, then you have to practice one hour, 20 minutes, like I do every day. Thank you very much.